Okay, this afternoon we have two special musics, uh, Faith and Malachi Vallejo and the Cook and Lemon families are going to give our special music and prayer is going to be offered by Ariel and Monica Solis and then of course our speakers is uh, Wes and Marion Peppers and we look forward to hearing the message for today. Shadows fall and the night covers fall and the things that my eyes can see. I'll never fear for the Savior is near. My Lord was with me. How can
good afternoon. Now it's time to kneel and ask the presence of God. So I ask you to please kneel with us. Heavenly Father, we're happy to be here uh, in this event. We know that a lot of people are coming from all over the country to come and learn and fellowship together, but especially learn about you and what you have to say about our families. Uh, we ask you to be with the Peppers family as they share a message, and please impress in our hearts the things that we need to learn and especially practice as we move throughout this weekend. Thank you for your blessings, for the opportunity to come and be with you and uh, to learn more about your word. Uh, send your spirit to open our minds to understand what is your will for our families, what is uh, your purpose for our marriages. Uh, so I ask you that you can be in this place and that we can um, be open to listen to your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon. I'm supposed to be on this side over ah. here. You're on this side. I don't want okay. him to be uncomfortable here. All right. <laughs> How's everybody this afternoon? Oh, you sound terrible again. How are you? How are you doing? Good. Your belly's full? Your mind's dull? We hope not, right? All right. Well, it's good to be here with you guys again this afternoon. And today, we're going to be talking about marriage and uh, how to connect with each other, hopefully, and how to, we're going to share five principles with you again that we have learned about marriage. Now, I just want to start by saying that um, we are not, just like we said yesterday, we're not perfect parents, we're not perfect, we don't have a perfect marriage either, and I don't think that anybody does, and there's only one perfect person in this relationship, and it's not her. Nor is it me, but it's the Lord, amen? You thought, wait a minute, what's he trying to say here, right? But, um, you, you know, marriage is a, is a complicated thing, and it will build our characters, and it will strengthen us if we're yielding ourselves to the Lord. So I want you guys to know that we are not experts, we are still growing, amen? amen. And anything you want to add to that? No. Okay, so... I just want you guys to know we're just sharing some things that have been a blessing to us and that we're not perfect at, but we know the principles, and God is helping us to grow each day, I believe. And I don't believe that we're in the same place uh, we were even when we first got married, but it's a constant growth experience. How long ago was that? That was. We've been married for 15 years, so why don't you tell us how we That's got together? What's that? That's incorrect. Almost 15 years. That's incorrect. What month is it? <laughs> 13 years. 13 years. That is 13 correct. Years. <laughs> it's, honestly, it's usually me that usually has the is. dates right. But. It usually is him, so I had, yeah. to, I had to catch you on that one. Yeah. So I'll just share a little bit, uh, a very short version of how we met, because if I let him do it, you guys know how that goes. You were here yesterday, so we'd be here a while. But I'm just going to give the short version of how we met. I actually um, had a friend who called me one day and he, and he said, I just want you to know that I'm getting married. And I'm getting married to someone that I met on the internet. And I thought, oh my goodness, what is he doing? He's, he's gone mad, he's gone crazy, he doesn't even know this person. And so a friend of, of mine and myself, we went on this website to see what he had gotten himself into. And lo and behold, I saw this man. Now, <laughs> and I got this proposal in a message, and I was like, what is this? You did no. not get a proposal in a message, absolutely not. But uh, it, <laughs> this is the short version, but basically I would not recommend everyone to go out and, and put a profile on the Internet. But sometimes God works through mysterious ways. And, uh, but we actually became friends because I found out that he was going to school about 15 minutes from where my father had just planted a church. So he started attending. I was in California Bible working at the time. 
And this is where I tell people that we actually have an arranged marriage because when my parents met him, they started secretly praying that when I met him in person, I would fall in love with him. And so um, I probably would have run the other way because at that time I was not ready to hear that. So they were very wise to keep that to themselves. But when I came back to Alabama where they were, um, we became very good friends. And over time, the Lord revealed it very clearly that um, we were to be life partners, that we had many similar goals in, in ministry and life, and our personalities just clicked. And, and as we became friends, that friendship grew into love and 13 years later, here we are. <laughs> well, here we are doing marriage. a marriage seminar for you. So probably several of you have been married a lot longer than us, um, but hopefully you'll still gain a blessing, amen? And you probably could teach us a few things, and I'm sure, but uh, we're all in this together, right? Well, let's have prayer together, and then we're going to dive in. Our message is called Restoring the Sacred Circle, Godly Love in the Home. And uh, we believe that these five principles will restore that sacred circle and will bring godly love to the home if our hearts are surrendered to the Lord. Amen? Well, let's have prayer together one more time. Father in heaven, we just ask your presence to be with us now and we ask your Holy Spirit to not just be in the room but also in the hearts and we pray, Lord, that you would open our eyes and our ears and our minds and our hearts to what you would say to us today and may we be able to take something away today that will strengthen our marriage, strengthen our homes, strengthen our parenting, and Lord, just to have an experience with you that will bring joy to our lives and prepare us for heaven. This is our prayer today, Lord, we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, just want to, uh, and we're not working again, start with a quote, this is bad, if we just don't, oh, wait a minute, maybe I need to turn it on. No, that didn't work either. Now I'm not sure if it's on or off. There we go. It says, from the Adventist home, page 17, God would have our families symbols of the family in heaven. Amen? So that's God's purpose for marriage. It's for his people to represent him on earth. It's for uh, his people to symbolize the union that exists between the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's what the purpose of a family is on the earth. Let parents and children bear this in mind every day. Realize, uh, relating themselves to one another as members of the family of God. Then their lives will be of such a character as to give the world an object lesson of what families who love God and keep His commandments may be. Christ will be glorified. His peace and grace and love will pervade the family circle with like a precious perfume. How do you think that's what you want your home to look like today? Now don't raise your hand for this, but how many of you is this what your home does look like now? We hope, that's what we're aiming for, though, right? We're aiming for that. And so studies are finding something very interesting. And this is not, a, not part, parenting part two, but I want you to notice this. That ages zero to three, a child watches and learns mostly from who? The mother. And I can attest to that. My daughter, when she gets upset, you say, you want to come to Papa? No, I want Mommy, right? And... So she's always wondering, that was the same thing with my son. But then they, there's a shift, ages three to five, they begin to watch and learn from the father. But notice this, between the ages of five to nine, who are they, what are they doing? They're watching the interaction between mother and father. How do you treat each other? And that's the age where they're going to learn the basis for how to treat their spouse. When I'm counseling young people, uh, and a young man is coming to me, I say, you watch how this young lady treats her father, because that's how she's going to treat you. The young ladies, I say, you watch how he treats his mother, because that's how he's going to treat you, right? You have to be very careful. So these influence the character for life. And a couple of quotes here. The most important thing a father can do for his children is to love their what? Mother. And I would, and I would say that the very same thing is true in the opposite end. The most important thing that children can do to see from their mother is how they love their father. And we need, we need to remember, too, that, that love is an action word. So we're not just saying every day, say, I love you, honey. That love is something that we need to be showing through the way that we act. Absolutely. And I, this is not in our notes, and I want to say it before I forget it because it relates to this a little bit. 
that it's more important. I've, I just read this article recently, and I agree with it 100%, and I think it's a, a created a big problems in homes and marriages, that the spouses should put each other first in the home, behind God, but the children should not become should not come before the other spouse. Now, some people may disagree with that, but I'm telling you, I think in the last 20 to 30 years, that's been a huge pitfall because it used to be that way years ago, and people had happier homes. And I think now that when we put ch children ought to see you putting their spouse first, and it also teaches them not to be selfish and not to be the rulers of the home. So anyway, enough on that. We'll keep going here. Another quote, a man ought to love, so love everybody a man ought to live so that everybody knows he's a Christian, and most of all, his family ought to know. All right, so don't, I, I want to say a few things to the single people real quickly. And uh, so you may be here saying, well, I'm, I'm not married, but you will be someday, you hope, right? Yeah, we had some interesting conversations at lunch with some of those singles, so yeah. I know you're out there so, listening so, up. <laughs> so for uh, Elaine and uh, Tom, they want a single section as well, how to prepare for marriage, so maybe next year. But 1 Corinthians, Paul says he would wish that everyone was like him. And what he was specifically talking about was being what? Being single. So Paul wished that everybody would be single. And the reality is that when you get a job and when you get married and every child you have, your time gets less and less what? Focus. You have less divided time, or you have more divided time. So God may not be calling you to a lifetime of single ministry, but it seems like for many single people, all they often spend their time doing is sitting around and complaining that they are single, right? And so the reality is that you have the most freedom, the most energy, the most time that you're ever going to have in your life when you're single. So use that time and energy to not be pursuing a spouse, but doing something for the Lord. And most likely, when you're doing something for the Lord, that person is going to end up doing the same, and that's where you're going to find them. Yeah, I was going to say, I remember there was a time in my life when I was so focused on being in a relationship, getting married, and I was far too young to even be worried about those things. But that's just what all the girls my age were talking about and thinking about. And it was just seemed the natural thing to do. And I was so consumed with it that I wasted a lot of time and a lot of energy thinking and all of the things that I was doing. And then I came to the place where I, I became kind of self-righteous and I became prideful. And I said, well, I'm not going to be like those girls with all of that drama. I don't need anything to do with men. I'm not going to get married. I'm just going to be single like Paul, and I'm going to do ministry, and that's going to be my life. And then I met him. <laughs> but so I think you have to be careful because you can find yourself in one of two camps. And you, in both, I don't. we need to be balanced in the way that we think about um, marriage and what God wants to do with our lives. So we need to realize that marriage is a wonderful thing, and God may be preparing someone for you, but the, the reality is, is that what we need to be doing is not being worried about either one. We need to focus on what God wants to do in our life and focus on our relationship with Him and let Him do the rest. So if you can't be happy living single with Christ your soul companion, you will likely rush into a huge mistake with marriage that will lead to major unhappiness. And so I, I'm not saying that, that you shouldn't be thinking about it, but you shouldn't be making it your sole f focus and energy. The Bible says, to everything there is a season, a time for every purpose, a time to embrace, and a time to what? Refrain from embracing. So there was a time for that. You have plenty of time to do that, a time to love and a time not to love. And Song of Solomon says, do not stir up or awaken love till it what? Till it pleases. In other words, not means when it feels good, it means until it's the proper time. That's what it means. It pleases the will of God till the time is right. That's what it's talking about. So is it better to go through a short, short time of patient waiting or to rush it, make a mistake, and be sad for the next 40 to 60 years? Which one do you think? Would you rather wait a few more years and be happy for the next 60? Or would you rather rush it now and be miserable for the next 60? Think about it, right? Pretty good uh, options there, right? Ellen White says, your feelings of unrest and loneliness may be for your good. Your Heavenly Father means to teach you to find in Him the friendship and love that will satisfy you most 
uh, set afire your most earnest hopes and desires. And so too many people are looking to human relationships to fulfill that which only Christ can be. And, and so you're only going to be truly happy with someone else because that person, no matter how great they are, no matter how loving they are, that person will not be able to meet every thought and need that you have in your life. Only Christ can do that. And uh, Christ did not put someone else in our life to fulfill those needs that only He can. So we have to look to Him first. All right. So if you want to uh, have more on singleness, we'll have to have a seminar on that. But that's all we got for you today. All right. So the theology of marriage, we're not going to go here and look at this uh, in depth. But I, I just want to talk about an element here quickly. The Bible says that two shall become what? One. Right? The two shall become one. And that Greek word is the word ekad, and I think I have it here. And it means, literally, one flesh. It's the plural form of one. It's the same, uh, uh, same word that's used in the book of Deuteronomy when it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. It says one, but it's the plural form. And so when we come together in one flesh, I have a whole section on this, but I didn't put it in here because of time. But here's the bottom line. If you are not following God's plan and you get yourself into a relationship where you are doing things that are not uh, intended until marriage, this is for the single people, one more, one more shot for the single people, then you, you're doing acts that are causing you to come together as one flesh, then when that thing breaks off, what is it similar to you doing? You're tearing apart that flesh that was intended to last forever, and it's like trying to rip off your arm from your body. Does that make sense? And then it's very painful, you become vulnerable, and then you continue the cycle. And it's very, very unhealthy, and it's very, very unwise. We need to remember, too, though, I, I have seen some marriages where they take that so literally, the two shall become one, that um, one individual in that relationship kind of loses their personality in the process. And God is not saying that when we become one, that we lose our individuality and we lose our own personalities and uniqueness. God made us that way for a reason. Um, but it does mean that we are one in purpose and that we are one physically, of course, emotionally, spiritually. I, I truly believe that the God had, they have their own uniqueness and their own personalities, but they are truly one in the things that they, their goals in life and their purposes. Amen. So in Genesis 2 and 3, you find this interesting concept of a covenant versus a contract type of marriage, okay? And every one of us in the room today is in one of these two types of marriages, okay? So let's take a look at this real quickly. In Genesis 2, I wish we had time to go through the verses and analyze it, but I'm just going to have to give you the punchline. But in the covenant relationship, the couple is joined together in every way. They are one what? They're one flesh, right? In a covenant... You are basically saying in a covenant, I would rather be split in two than to split you in two. Because that's often what times. You remember God, when He make a covenant with His people, He would cause them to bring a sacrifice. And you remember when Abraham laid it out and God walked through the middle of it? God is basically saying, I will be split in two for you. And that's what Jesus did, right? And so it's always about that splitting two. And so God is saying in that covenant relationship, I would rather be split in two than to see you split in two. So that means somebody's going to have to make a what? A sacrifice, right? And so that's a covenant relationship. I will serve you above myself and seek the other person's good rather than my own. Covenant relationship. However, in seeking your good, my needs are also met. My greater joy is in seeing your needs met rather than my own. So what are some practical ways that we might see that happen in a marriage? I read the slides. You can give us the practical <laughs> thoughts. Well, you need to go back. I can't see them now. Okay. <laughs> so in a marriage, of course, we all it's a give or take type of situation. When we are in a covenant relationship, we are having to sacrifice sometimes because we're wanting to see the good for our spouse even more than ourselves. And that's not always an easy thing. So what if I've had a really, really hard day I've been at home with the kids, and I'm just stressed, I'm tired, I'm exhausted. My kids have been, 
less than pleasant for the majority of the day. And my husband comes in the house and he's cheerful and he's happy to see me. And he says, hi, honey, how are you? What's for supper? And my initial reaction is what? Oh, well, what's for supper? When did I have time to make supper? I didn't have time to make supper because I was taking care of your kids all day. <laughs> That's my reaction. That's not probably seeing um, for his good. He probably had a really hard day at work too. Knowing my husband, he also had a stressful day at work. He's coming home excited and ready to see his spouse and his kids. So maybe for that moment, I could put myself aside, not that I shouldn't have a conversation with him later and we can talk about some of those things, but maybe in that moment, I can say, I'm so glad to see you too, honey. Why don't we sit down and talk about our day? <laughs> then I can tell him all about my day. <laughs> but instead of just spewing out everything that's inside of me and selfishly wanting to take care of myself in that moment, maybe I should take a minute to think of my spouse and try to relieve some of his stress and pressures as well. And it goes both ways. And then once I've heard her out and she's explained to me the rough day that she's had, what could I say? Well, maybe I should make supper tonight, right? So order in pizza it is, yeah? No, no, I'm kidding. Uh, not, not where we pizza. live. Order in Chinese. No, I'm kidding. Pizza's my favorite. My son would eat pizza every day with me. So that's the difference um, in self-sacrifice. So seeking to bless you rather than myself and others focus rather than um, self-focused. So there's a text there, Genesis 2.23. In a covenant relationship, when we each are looking to who? to Christ as the center of our relationship, notice what happens in the covenant relationship. What's happening? We're both being what? Drawn together. Instead of looking at my, at my own needs or her faults, I'm looking to God and saying, Lord, how can I be drawn closer to you through serving her? Listen, that's not an easy thing to do, is it? It's not an easy thing to do at all, but I'm telling you, if we want our relationships to improve, that's what it takes. It takes putting aside ourselves. That is, what Christ, that is the ultimate thing that Christ did for us. And that's what he's calling us to do if we want those relationships to continue to grow and deepen. But in the fall of man, we find in Genesis chapter 3, we see that that covenant relationship that God established, where I'd rather be split in two to split you in two, kind of morphed, didn't it? It mutated. It evolved. And uh, in Genesis chapter 3, I'm just going to read this real quick. In Genesis chapter 3 and verse 12, I want you to notice what happens here. <clears throat> it says, Then the man said, this is after they ate from the tree, he says, uh, God says, or I'm sorry, God's calling to them, and they say, well, we were naked and afraid. And he said, who told you you were naked? And then the man said, the woman whom you gave me to be with me she gave me of the tree, and I what? I ate it. So what's the, what's the first thing that happens in a contract relationship? I'm blaming. And then what happens? What does the woman do? So he says to the woman, what, what do you have to say about this? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. And then God said to the serpent, uh, he cursed the serpent, but ultimately you, you know that the serpent had already been blaming God. So in that shifting from a covenant relationship to a contact relationship, uh, there is the number one element there is blame. And I'm thinking about my needs rather than whose needs? That other person's needs. So you want to read these? You want to go sure. through these? Sure. So the, the flip side to this, of course, is that contract relationship. So pulled apart in every way. So instead of coming together and not wanting to tear apart, you're being pulled apart. A contract would rather split you in two than for me to be split in two. I'm thinking about myself there. We'll serve myself above you and seek that the good or my good rather than your good. In seeking my good, my needs are not are met. Are met. I cannot see. I need to go to the eye doctor. <laughs> are met at your expense. And then I can only be with you if you meet my needs. So, I mean, that's kind of a popular thing nowadays. And you hear in, in marriages and relationships um, that, you know, if you're not meeting my needs, I'm out of here. That's not a covenant relationship. It's a contract. And this, Very sad how, it, how yeah. that's, people are so focused on that. Very focused on it. This came um, 
This, you read it. <laughs> this carries me into a cycle of empty selfishness, but I pursue it anyway. I think you need to read the slides from now I'll on. I'll read the slides, all right. <laughs> so, go ahead. I'm seeking to use you rather than to what? Bless you. So if we're in a relationship, especially a marriage, and I'm thinking to myself, what am I going to get out of this? If I help her do the dishes, what am I going to get? If she, and she's thinking, if I'm doing his laundry, what am I going to get? You know, and, and guys, I mean, we're just going to be straight up here. We're going to be discreet and modest, but straight up. Typically, we're thinking about something that we're interested in, okay, when we're doing those things. That's a contract relationship. And, and, but at the same time, it's a natural need of a man. It, it's, it's a physical thing. We'll talk more about that. But I become self-focused rather than other focus. So do you see the difference between the two? So in one relationship, the covenant relationship, I'm looking to God. and the other relationship, I'm looking either at my needs or her faults, right? And all that does is it drives us away from each other and away from God. Does that make sense? So as you examine your own lives today, examine your own relationships, your own marriages, don't raise your hand, don't... don't uh, nod your partner in the, in the side, but think about to yourself your own actions, not their actions. You may be married right now to the most selfish individual on the planet, but I don't want you to think about their actions. I want you to think about your own actions right now. Are you in a covenant relationship or are you in a contract relationship? You're in one or the other. One or the other. Now, I hate to do this because this is really good, but I can't see a thing that's up there. Uh, maybe I can come over here. No, I can't do it, but I'll give you the slide. It's okay. It's essentially everything that we already said. But here's what God did. When that relationship went from covenant to contract, and both of them were contract people after Genesis 3, right? They were both blaming each other. They were thinking about themselves. They were after their own needs. They were upset with each other. God stepped in and He said, Look, neither, most of you have lost the covenant concept. You've lost the, the, the willingness to be split in two for each other. So guess what? I'm going to be split in two for you. And I'm going to lead you back to that covenant relationship, being willing to split in two instead of seeing the other one split in two. How many can say amen to that today? That if it was not for Christ doing that, we would all be lost without hope. And there would be no happy marriages whatsoever. So how many of you want to have a covenant contract or a covenant relationship instead of a contract relationship. Amen? Amen. So how do we do that? So how do we do that? Well, let's take a look at five areas of a covenant marriage. And the first one is commitment. What is it, everybody? Commitment. It's commitment. So write that down. We're not going to look up every verse here. Um, but we, I do want to look up uh, Matthew chapter 19 and verses 5 and 6. Matthew chapter 19, verses 5 and 6. You want to read that for us, honey? Matthew chapter 19, verse 5 and 6. All right, and said, For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. So then they are no longer two, but one flesh, and therefore what God has joined together let no man separate. So the, first, the, the main key there in that text is what God has done what? Join together, let no man separate. That includes you, that includes your spouse, and that includes anyone outside your spouse. Ellen White says this in the book Ministry of Healing, page 360. Though difficulties, perplexities, and discouragements may arise, let neither husband or wife harbor the thought that their union is a what? Mistake. Or a... Disappointment. So you're not even to dwell upon the bad areas of your marriage. Determined to be all that it is possible to be to each other. Continue the early attentions in every way. Encourage each other in f fighting the battles of life. Study to advance the happiness of each other. Let there be mutual love, mutual forbearance. Then marriage, instead of being the end of love, will be, as it were, the very beginning of love. The warmth of true friendship... The love that binds heart to heart is a foretaste of the joys of heaven. And so 
many young people have this idea, and we all did when we were young, that when we get married, it's just like, wow, you know, everything's going to be bliss. And then at the end of the first year, we're like, you know, some of us, ready to, some of you are looking at me like, what are you talking about? Ready to what? We're, we're ready almost to choke each other, right? And uh, there's a lot of adjustments to be made, but before marriage, we have no idea of, of, of the challenges that lie ahead. But it doesn't always have to be that way. God intends, just like baptism, when we're baptized, is that the end all? No, we're growing deeper. God wants us to grow in that marriage. There's an old saying called, the older the violin, the sweeter the music. Amen? And so we want that music to play sweeter and sweeter. And so there's a few things in commitment. And the first one, I'm just going to hit this one, then I'll let you hit the next one. Never use the D word. What's the D word? When we were early in our marriage and we had some disagreements, a common phrase was, why don't you just divorce me? Now, some of you look kind of convicted when I said that, because you're probably saying that right now. Or you either say that or you use it as a threat. Well, I'm just going to divorce you. We realized very soon in our marriage that that was a very bad idea. Very bad idea when we have a disagreement. And we both agreed that we would not use that phrase again. And we held each other accountable to it. Sometimes there has been a time when we have gotten a little bit too out of control and we just throw it. We don't really mean it, but we just say it to, to, just in the heat of the moment. And you've probably said it too. It's getting quite quiet in here. You guys are getting really still. But we decided that we would not do that and then we held each other accountable to it. Choose to love in the good and the bad. Don't run away when things get hard. I have personal experience with this. Um, sometimes things can happen in our marriage that we didn't expect and that happened to us just a few years into our marriage. Um, we were very young. I was, what, 25 at the time. You we were 28-ish. And um, he, we had had a very wonderful marriage together up to that point. We were in um, California working for the Lord. We were at Amazing Facts. And my husband was diagnosed with cancer. And um, when you are just starting out in your marriage and you are working for the Lord and things are going great, the last thing you want or expect to have to deal with is something like cancer, especially when you're this young. And um, it was a very trying time for us. Um, it got to the point where the doctors, he, he ended up catching a septic infection and was in ICU fighting for his life. And the doctors many times told me they didn't know that he was going to live through the night. They would call me back to the hospital. Um, I remember during that time going through all of that, and people would come up to me and they would say, you are such a strong person. I don't know how you're going through something like this. You're so strong. And you know what I realized through that experience and being on the other side of this experience now is that none of us are strong people. Some of us have stronger personalities than others. But when it comes down to it, when we are facing a challenge in our lives, we are all weak, sinful human beings. And there are times when we want to run away. But when we keep our eyes focused on Christ, then all of a sudden he makes us strong. It was that scripture that says, you know, we are weak, but we can be strong through Christ. And that was the experience that I had. And actually... It's strange, but there are times when people will ask us, well, what are some of the most precious times of your marriage, things that have helped you grow the most? And the first thing that comes to my mind is the time that my husband was dying in the hospital bed with cancer. As horrible as it was and as scary as it was, it was one of the, the sweetest times in our marriage because it drew us closer together. Because we had, at that point, it seemed like we had no one else in the world but each other and but Christ. And because we were so focused on God to get us through that time, he did, just we saw, like we saw earlier. He drew us together, and we grew from that experience, and we realized that we could face anything as long as our eyes were focused on Christ. And so it was a very powerful experience for us, not one that I want to relive. Thankfully, the Lord healed him from cancer, and now we are here before you, um, healthy and strong, but only by God's grace. Just, just because you think you're incompatible, I mean, in your marriage you might think, well, I'm just not compatible with them. You are probably more compatible than you think you are if you learn the right tools. The three things that people argue the most about in marriage 
are communication, finances, and intimacy. Those are the top three things. And if you figure out how to communicate with each other with a few simple tools, if you figure out a, a good, suitable way to handle your finances, um, those, those things take the pressure off and allow intimacy to come about. So it's likely that you're more compatible than you think you are if you just commit yourself to it. We're gonna, some, some of the other things we're going to talk about. So don't go to parents or unqualified others about your problems. Go to the Lord and to each other. Only counsel with a pastor or a professional counselor. Your mother is not your counselor once you get married about marriage issues. Now, if you're buying a car or you want to know what kind of thing, if you're you know, doing something in the kitchen, that's one thing. But with your marriage, your mother is not your counselor. I'm talking to the gentleman and to the lady, to, to both. And, you, you know, every time I see families, every time I've counseled with couples and the in-laws are involved, it's always the biggest problem. The two shall leave, the, the, um, the husband shall leave his mother and father, and the two shall become one flesh. You are leaving your parents behind in that aspect when you come together. Does that make sense? And they are not your best counselors. You should not go to them or others. And look, we've made that mistake before, and we know. Uh, actually, I make that mistake. She doesn't. She hasn't made that mistake. I'll confess that. The society says that when things get too hard, I have a right to walk away. I've heard people, on, I've heard counselors on the radio say, well, look, you know, if, if, if you're unhappy in this relationship, then you have, a, you have the right to be happy and you can walk away from it, a, a marriage of 30 years. That is baloney because I have, I have not met one person in my life who said, yeah, I walked away from that marriage and I'm so glad that I did in the end. I mean, unless it's like an abusive relationship or something like that. Yeah. But most people are riddled with regrets and emotional damage that is very difficult to recover yeah, from. Yeah, I was just going to throw that in there. You need to have common sense here and be balanced because we are not talking about situations of abuse or um, severe infidelity and those types of things. Yeah. We need to use common sense and the Bible does talk about that. I'm just talking about people sometimes they just, something gets a little bit hard and they want to get out of it. I mean, I used to be that way with just about everything. So choosing to do the things that you don't like to do, even when you know it will help or meet the need of your spouse. And um, that's a very important concept. And I'm trying to remember why I put shower in there. Oh, I remember story. very remember. well. Okay, she remembers. <laughs> that's all, that's all that matters. I remember because he told this story in our church when we were pastoring in Lansing. And my church, our church members at the time, they still to this day, they do not let me forget about this. So, um, do you remember when you came home and I asked you to help the kids and get them in the bathroom? Oh, yeah. That's what I remember. I do remember that. So, now. what is your favorite thing to do in parenting? It's to give baths to the children. He despises giving baths. It's the worst thing in the world. I don't like doing <laughs> he it. He can't stand it. And so, but often he's, he's self-sacrificing. Now, here's the thing. When he was a pastor, he wasn't usually home in the evenings, and so... He wasn't used to having to do the, the nighttime routine with the kids. And we had a system, and everything was just so-so. And um, so when he would come home, I'm like, yes, he's home to help. And one night, it had been one of those days, and I said, can you please get, I think it was Levi, in it the bath Levi. for me. It's always Levi. Can you please get Levi in the bath for me? I need to get Leon addressed. And do you remember what you said? Yeah, I was in a, no, you, you say that. You say that part. I don't remember. Uh, I believe your, your exact words were, uh, no, I really don't want to do that because it's really hard for me. <laughs> Doesn't that sound terrible? <laughs> Nothing against any millennials here, but it sounds like a millennial attitude, right? Like, it's really hard for me. I don't want to do that. So I walked in the other room and I muttered under my breath, right, like it's not hard for me. And, and I heard her say he heard that. Me say it. And, and what did I went you do? Did I went and did it. He was like that son who repented and came back and, and did. And then you know what happened? I was home in the evening and I had to go back to the church for a meeting and I had on my suit and I handed my son the, the little, the little sprayer. sprayer and guess who got a come bath more than him in my suit? He sprayed me all over, up and down. I probably laughed yeah. a little too much. But, anyway. so, but so. here's the thing. Choosing the things you don't like to do to bless your spouse. That's a covenant relationship. Amen? 
And uh, you may not like to do it, but when you do it, you'll be glad you did it. You'll be glad you did it, and it's a blessing. Guard your thoughts. Focus on what is good. Um, it's very easy. I, I can tell you this, and, and, and we're in an Adventist setting, but I, I, I really get irritated when we come together in an Adventist setting and we, and we think for the sake of modesty we can't be real about things, but the reality is we're facing those issues and, but we're afraid to talk about it because somebody might judge us. Well, I'm not afraid. I'm the speaker and I'm not worried about it. I do want to be, I do want to be godly and, and modest about it, but here's the reality. Most of the time, when you have an argument and a disagreement with your spouse, the enemy will send someone else into your life that day who is of the opposite gender who will be there to meet the need or attempt to meet the need that your spouse didn't meet that morning. Or they'll be there to console you or to speak softly to you or to speak tenderly to you or to put that hand on the shoulder and be that sympathetic ear. And I can guarantee you he's going to do that somehow in some way. And we have to guard ourselves because the temptation is to say, well, he listened to me when my own husband didn't listen to me. Or, wow, she, she's sympathetic to me and she put her hand on her shoulder my wife wouldn't even give me a hug today. Or whatever it was. And there's always that temptation. And Satan is watching and waiting every moment to fill that gap with something that will destroy you. It's that simple. Anything you want to add to that? Um, I'm going to keep going here because we've got to move on. Pray together and ask God to teach you how to love each other. I heard a couple say this one time. And for us, we're not even perfect at this. There are some days that, that, that we miss getting to have extended prayer time together. We have family worship. And, and, I, and it's my responsibility as, as the husband. I get up early and leave. I get home late and we're tired and we just want to go to bed. And there's times we miss it. I guarantee you that everybody in the room has missed it at some point in time. So nobody has to be holier than anyone else. It, it just happens. That's the reality of life. But when you kneel together and when you pray for each other in each other's presence, there's nothing more powerful to change your heart and to change your marriage than that. I know it's true for me. When I pray for her, even when I'm frustrated, maybe in a frustrated moment with her, and I pray for her, out loud, and I hear myself praying for it, it changes my heart. And that may be the hardest thing in the world for you. It's typically harder for men than it is for women. But gentlemen, if you'll do that, it will, it will improve your relationship and your outlook towards your wife. It's a beautiful thing. Amen? Make it a practice every day to strive at least once a day to pray for each other in each other's presence. You want to add anything? Well, I was just going to say, it's not just men. For me, uh, coming into our marriage, it's extremely difficult for me to pray out loud for my husband. I don't know why, it just is. Um, it's hard for me to be that vulnerable with him. I'm not typically an emotional person. Um, and so the Lord has really had to work with me on that. But it's true. And when you hear your spouse praying for you out loud, it really changes you as well. It's very important. And uh, I'm usually the more emotional, romantic person, and she's the more reasonable, practical straightforward person, and uh, so we're good for each other. It balances each other out. All right, number two, radical honesty and communication. What kind of honesty? Radical honesty. Does your spouse have a right to know about your private life? Does your spouse have a right to pick up your cell phone at any time and go through it? Does your spouse have a right to check your Facebook at any time? What do you think? You'd be amazed how many people say no to that, to that answer. They say, that's my cell phone. Separate bank accounts are about the worst idea on the planet. Separate anything, any accounts are the worst idea on the planet. And you ought to know, your wife, you know, as men, we don't like people to just know what we're doing. I mean, I just, I just remember the days when I didn't have a cell phone, I didn't have an email, and I could be out at the fishing pond by myself for half a day, and nobody knew where I was, and it was the most wonderful thing in the world. And then he got married. And then I got married. 
And, and, you know, wives just want to know what we're doing. They're not trying to be nosy in particular, but us men, we're just like, why are you always on me? Why do you have to know everything? And, and, and I come home and she wants to know about my day and I'm just like, look, like I sent some emails and we had a boring meeting and I talked to a few people. What's so exciting about that? I don't, I don't want to talk about it again. But it's important to them. They want to hear it. And for the sake of love, we should tell them. Amen? They're not trying to find out if you did something. It took me years to figure this out. And sometimes I still get that rebellion. I'm just like, why do you want to know that? It doesn't matter. It means nothing in the grand scheme of things. But, but, it matters to her because she cares about me. And I should be thankful that she cares enough about me to know what's happening in my day. Amen? Well, and you learn over the years, just like we have little phrases that we use with our children, we also have phrases that we can use on each other now. And so when he starts to get that way, all I can say, if he says something like, why do you need to know? And I just say, I don't. I don't need to know. I just want to know. And that kind of reminds him, oh, yeah, yeah. And maybe I'm overreacting a little bit Guys, again. You know what I'm talking about, right? <laughs> you just... You just do your thing and you want to be left, you just don't want to have to answer to anybody. It's a man thing. And so I've tried to help her be more sympathetic and, and I've tried to be more compassionate. And the Lord's helped us. It's been a blessing. We're still growing. but. And can I say too, there is a difference between having the right to go through your spouse's cell phone or Facebook page or et cetera, et cetera. There's a difference between having the right and doing it annoyingly and irritatingly and with the point of, exactly. of that you don't trust your spouse because there are some spouses that are like that. They have to check their phone every two seconds because they don't trust them. There's something going on in that marriage that you need to discuss that's a deeper issue. There's a difference. There's a difference. And um, that I, I, there was a time when I thought, you know, I, my, she doesn't need to look at my phone. But then I realized it's the right thing to do. And, and she has the passwords for my phone. She has the password. I, I deleted my Facebook because I got tired of it. But I, I gave her the, she had the password to that. She has the password to everything. And so I don't want to be hiding anything from her. Um, understanding is the most important element. Full attention is crucial. Nothing worse than, you know, we were at the, when we were in South Africa, we were eating lunch at this Indian restaurant, and there was another couple across from us, and they, we were there, all there for probably well over an hour, maybe an hour, up to an hour and a half, and I Slow kept years. looking over at this couple, and they did not say a word to each other for an hour and a half. They sat there on their cell phones like this, uh, drinking Coke from the same can, but not speaking to each other. And I thought, what a shame. And I decided that, uh, and I'm still, it's still working on it, it's a process for me, that when I come home, I want to give my full attention to my family. So I bought this box from Hobby Lobby that says blessed on it. And I put this box beside the front door. And when I come home, my cell phone goes in that box. And I check it about every three hours for about five minutes. Because as my children are growing, I, I'm looking at them, and I don't want to be, when they're calling me for some very important moment, I don't want to be stuck on my cell phone sending a text that's not going to matter tomorrow. Yeah, and I just have to put this in there that you should have seen the excitement when he discovered Hobby Lobby. I just thought it was pretty funny. He said, have you ever been in Hobby Lobby before? It's amazing. <laughs> and I took that as a sign from the Lord to go on a shopping spree to Hobby Lobby. No. But anyways. <laughs> All right. Speak for yourself and don't mind read the other person, right? Don't, don't assume that you know what they're thinking. Give us an example of that, honey. Oh, no. I'm still on Hobby Lobby, sorry. <laughs> so, so mind reading. So if, um, if you come to me and you say, I don't, I don't know, I can't think of an example. Can you think of an well, example? Well, let's just say um, I can't think of one. Oh, brother. <laughs> But you guys probably know what, I mean, you know what we're talking about, that just because she says something, I'm assuming she's saying something that she's not. But I always need to stop and ask the question, are you saying this instead of this? Um, because that's, that's one of my problems. When she makes a phrase, I assume that she's jumping to conclusions about what I'm doing, and I get frustrated. And so we need to be speaking for ourselves, not mind-reading the other person. 
talking in small chunks, stopping and listening, and then paraphrasing. That's truly listening, not just going on and on and on and assuming that I know everything about that situation. Of course, watching your tone and body language, avoiding the eternal phrases. You know what those are? You always, you never, you always nag me. You always uh, um, are being critical of me. You never show me appreciation, right? Is that likely true in any relationship? Probably not, right? Anything you want to add? Be careful about withdrawing in silence and use the 24-hour rule. Now, sometimes I think it is healthy to, to step away for a moment. I mean, this is the same for parenting, too. Sometimes we need to step away to have some prayer and some silence, but people that give the silence treatment, that is not effective. You need to come back together and you need to talk about things together. Yes, you do need a break, but you need to come back together. And so within 24 hours, as the Bible says, uh, don't let the sun go down on your wrath, right? And so the 24-hour rule is even at, here's the thing, here's the thing about don't let the sun go down on your wrath. There may be a major issue of disagreement that you have with each other. At the, when the sun's going down, you may not be ready to discuss that issue yet. Does that make sense? But you can be ready to put aside your anger and forgive that person. Are you with me? You may not be able to talk about that issue till tomorrow or the next day. Make sense? But that doesn't mean you have to stay angry and mistreat each other. Are you with me? Okay. All right. Don't nag or criticize. You want to talk about that? Should I talk about that? I don't know. It's up to you. <laughs> Women, we really do have a problem with nagging. I am the first to admit it. Uh, and sometimes we think, like, if you haven't done it, then you must not have heard me. So I need to tell you over and over and over again. And, yeah, men do not like to be nagged. And uh, that's all I have to say. We know. We don't need to be told. We know when we're nagging. We just need to choose to stop. <laughs> Anybody here like nagging? Okay, good. Take, take time at the end of the day to talk on a general basis. You know, I realized that when I was going in ministry that I, I, I was always thinking to myself, well, at some point things are going to open up and we'll have some family time. We'll have time to chat. We'll have time to spend together. We'll have time for a date. And then months go by and it never happens. So I learned to actually schedule family time in my calendar. I, we schedule date night. Um, we don't, it doesn't always happen the way we hope to, but 80% of the time it does. So we have four nights a week on Tuesday nights. And one night a week, we each take one of the children on a date. So I take my daughter, she takes my son. Then the next week we swap and I take my son, and she takes the daughter. And then twice a month, we go on a date, and we find a babysitter. Amen? And uh, you'll be amazed. Our kids so look forward to the date night. They say, where are we going tonight? And you don't always have to spend money. Uh, you can go, there's all kinds of things to do for free. I mean, my our, daughter likes yeah, to go. The library is our son's the li favorite. Our, our son likes to go to the library and, and look at books and, and just to spend time. And so it's so huge. And, but you have to schedule that time. And there's nothing wrong with scheduling that time. And I just tell my, I've told my church members in the past, they say, well, we need an extra finance committee meeting this month. When are we going to do it? Oh, that Tuesday? And I say, no, I'm sorry, I'm unavailable. I don't tell them I'm taking my son somewhere. I just say, I have an appointment at that time. You can tell your coworkers the same thing. I have an appointment at that time. I'm unavailable. Unavailable. And that's the end of it. And uh, so, uh, very important to do that. All right. Taking ownership and apologizing without explanation. I used to, when I would do something I shouldn't do to my wife, you know, I would, I would say, honey, I'm really sorry. And then I would say, I really didn't mean to hurt you. And then I would go on and try to explain everything, all the reasons why I love her and why I would never try to hurt her intentionally. And it took me years to realize she didn't want me to do that. Why? The reason is when you're in the middle of something like that and you've been hurt, you don't need them to tell you all the reasons why they hurt you and why it's okay. You just need them to take ownership of it and apologize for it. Now, later on, when you're having a conversation, it's a good time to discuss those things and to understand each other. But when it has just happened, we do not need to explain why we did that thing. We just need to apologize for it. And I was always trying to justify my good intentions to her. 
Why and, did you know what we're talking about? And, right? and what I would say was, honey, I never in a million years thought that you were intentionally trying to hurt me. I know you, I love you, I know the type of person you are, and I know that you wouldn't do that. But the reality is that you did hurt me. And sometimes that's the case. We, as sometimes maybe we do intentionally hurt one another, but usually it's not intentional because we love that person. We don't mean to hurt them. But if we have hurt them, then we need to make it right, and we need to apologize for it. And so apologize without explanation. Amen? How many ladies think that would be a good idea for your husbands to do? Don't get them in trouble. Nobody wants to <laughs> admit it. But you all know it's true. All right. So for ladies, don't expect a man to get it. Tell them exactly what you're thinking. Don't drop hints and then be so disappointed and sad when they don't get it. Men, do not think that way. You just tell them, I want you to take out the trash. Don't say, boy, you know. Trash is know, getting that, full over there. That, uh, <laughs> there's a little bit of dust beside the trash can, and you, or, or there's this little... You know, there's this thing sitting beside there and you point their attention to that, hoping that they'll see the trash is full and they'll take it out. Just say, take out the trash and we'll do it. And um, very important to do that. Men, recognize that women will say it's fine when it isn't. You can almost guess that when, you say, when they say it's fine, it's just not. It's just not ever going to be, okay? And there's other ways that they say it's fine, but when they say it's fine, it's not fine. Go ahead and do it. It's okay. Just go ahead yeah, and do it. Yeah, go ahead and do it. Go ahead and do it. I don't, I, I don't mind no, if you do it. Don't do it. And, uh, <laughs> and they're not looking at you in the eye when they say that. Just don't do it. And women, we Amen. have a responsibility too. We shouldn't be saying that if it's not what we really mean. Amen. So don't mind read. That's Always right. one vocal one in the audience. You know, they're not laughing at my jokes, but they're laughing at yours. I'm not sure what's going on there, but... Don't mind read. Communicate. Amen? Amen. I'm really curious about the peanut butter. Well, the, the, the thing with the peanut butter is we're running out of time, but she likes smooth and I like crunchy. So when she says go buy peanut butter at the store, what kind do I buy? Crunchy. When I bring it home, she says, where's why did you buy butter? crunchy? Right, where's the peanut butter? I said, it's right there. She said, that's not peanut butter. That's crunchy peanuts. And so, uh, communication, amen? Amen. All right. Major decisions, we need to move along here. Major decisions, you know, you're not spe you need to set an amount of money that you can spend without talking to each other. And usually it's less than $100. If you spend over $100, you need to speak to your wife, or whatever amount you sent. Does that make sense? Gentlemen, don't come home with a $600 toy. Don't come home with a $4,000 brand new riding lawnmower that's the coolest thing you've ever seen, and you, and you just expect her to be excited about it. Even if it's for her, especially if it's her, for her, don't come home with a $4,000 lawnmower and say it's for you, honey, please. Don't not, do that. It's not going to be a good idea, right? I mentioned separate accounts, but we have, which we actually haven't done this in a while, but we should probably get back to it, this thing we call free money or mad money where it's your monthly allowance and you can spend it on whatever you want. If you want to save it, and you don't have to answer to that amount. Um, and it's very nice to do that. And then um, it, it gives you a little bit of freedom to do that. But you need to communicate with that. Soft answer turns away wrath, but grievous words stir up what? Stir up anger. Are we only on number three? Trust and respect. She's yeah, going to talk a little bit about this. We're going to have to fly through this. So go ahead and go to the next slide. Around every family, there is a sacred circle that should be kept unbroken. Within this circle, no other person has a right to come. Let not the husband or the wife permit another to share the confidence that belongs solely to themselves. This is so important and will save so much heartache in your marriage. Um, you can go ahead and talk about that if you want. Oh, go ahead. Well, I, I don't know that I'm going to refer to the circle, That's fine. but I'm just going to say that um, this is another thing that we had to learn the hard way early on in our marriage, that often um, we would go to other people when we were frustrated. And, and I can say, and we've talked about this, so it's okay for me to talk about this, but um, it was really hard for me especially. I was raised in a home where I was raised to be very, extremely loyal. Now, I have a lot of other faults, a lot of other faults, but I'm a very loyal person. And she I, have as many as she thinks she does. <laughs> but um, anyways, he was not raised in the same environment as I was. And so in the beginning, he often would go and talk about some of the things that we were struggling with. 
And then I would find out about it. And it was the most mortifying, embarrassing, humiliating thing for me to experience. And it really broke down the trust in our marriage. And in, let me just yeah. say, in my mind, though, it wasn't that big of a deal. I'm just mm -hmm. saying, hey, I need help with this issue, so I'm going to talk to somebody. But for her, it was super embarrassing. And I couldn't grasp that. Um, and it's the difference that we have, but I've, I'm stri I've been striving and gotten much better at it, by the grace of God, to not do that as much. And, and the thing is, is that unless you're talking about these issues with one another, how are you supposed to know? You get married to someone and you think you know everything. You do not know everything. Your personalities are different. You've come from different backgrounds. You've got to have serious conversations about these things. But this is across the board. If you are struggling with something and you really need help, then you go together and you find a pastor or a professional counselor and you talk about those things together. Do not go and confide in, especially if it's somebody that's a mutual friend, you are breaking down um, that person's respect for your spouse. And women, I want to address specifically this, and this will go into the next section, which is respect, I believe. So I'm kind of combining the two, but we often have a, uh, a weakness, and when we're with our female friends, we're with our girlfriends, and we start talking and we start laughing and making jokes about our husbands with our friends, do not, I beg of you, do not do that because you, especially for me, my husband was in ministry and then we would be together and there would be a temptation sometimes to laugh and make jokes about my husband that I think are not a big deal. But you are tearing down the respect of your spouse when you do that. And, and I know for a husband especially, for a man, respect is huge and they, they want to feel that their wife loves and respects them and will talk highly of them when they're around other people. Uh, it's very important. And the same thing with guys, you know, when you're in the locker room, the guy making jokes about the old lady and whatever, you don't have to participate in that. And you do not, you, you want, your, your wife is your queen and you want her to be elevated and you do not want to be speaking negatively. So this little circle here, you have the inner circle, which is God, you, and your spouse. Amen? Then the next circle out is your children. You should not be discussing your problems in front of your kids. It creates all kinds of problems. And this is, this is one area where we've had to really strive in because it's easy to make a quick comment thinking the kids don't hear, and then they do hear it. And uh, so you need to reserve those intense conversations for the bedroom. And we all have those conversations. I mean, we're going to have disagreements. You don't have a bad marriage if you have disagreements. Amen? It's how you handle them determines whether your marriage is good or not so good. Then you have extended family, and then you have friends, acquaintances, and coworkers. Your discussions, your, your, your issues of marriage, your, your, your um, inner um, elements of your marriage need to remain inside the inner circle with you, God, and spouse unless you're seeking a counselor together. Amen? Make sense? So important. You will save yourself a boatload of trouble uh, and a boatload of embarrassment. So following through on what you say, you will do. Even if in the small things, like being at home at a set time, promises to children, future promises. My wife, this is one of our biggest struggles. She'll call me and say, what time are you going to be home? And I'll say, oh, you know, 5 o'clock. And then it's 5.45 when I roll in. And I'm, in my mind, I'm thinking, well, she'll understand because between 4.50 and 4.05 when I was planning to leave, this, this, and this happened. This person came in to talk to me. This person stopped me in the hallway, and I couldn't get out the door. So she'll be good with it. Well, in her mind, I've broken a promise, right? And so I need to strive. So finally, she got through to me, and I'm still not perfect at it. But she says, if you'll just send me a text and say, hey, it's going to be 545. So, you know, some, then I go back sometimes to that thing where she'll say, what time are you going to be home? I'll say, I don't know. Because if I say I'm going to be home at this time and I'm not, you're not happy. And that's why we need <laughs> so to compromise say, <laughs> and we need to be understanding on the other end too. And, and, um... so, so we work. <laughs> mm -hmm. We work together on it. And the Lord is helping us. Amen. So communication. The reality is if I send that text and she knows that I'm going to be home a little bit later, she's good with it. And I just need to learn to do that more often. And I am doing that more often. Make sense? All right. Respect from Ministry of Healing. We need to quickly go here. Neither the husband or the wife should attempt to exercise over the other an arbitrary control. 
Do not try to compel each other to yield to your wishes. You cannot do this and retain each other's love. Be kind, patient, forbearing, considerate, and courteous. By the grace of God, you can succeed in making the other happy, as in your marriage vow you promised to do. So, gentlemen, get rid of the idea, submit yourself to me as your husband. Because that only works when you are loving your wife as Christ has loved the church. And, she said, and it says that she's to submit herself to you. That means that she makes the choice to submit herself when you have loved her the way Christ said to love. It's not a matter of you telling or coercing or forcing. Does that make sense? Anything you want to say? Good. We're leaving out some things, but we have to move here. Don't embarrass your spouse in public or your children. We talked about that. Don't demean them. Don't talk about the weaknesses or shortcomings. You know, she, she doesn't cook so well or whatever. You know, that kind of stuff will be very embarrassing. will break down those problems. Um, do talk positively. Do talk about their good character traits and do talk about their accomplishments. This will not only uh, leave a good impression with the other person, but it will cause you to love your spouse more. Amen? It will also help shun attempts by others to inappropriately enter the circle that is reserved for you and your spouse. Make sense? Because the more you talk negatively about your spouse, if that person has the wrong intentions, they're going to be listening very closely to what you're saying, and they're going to strive to meet that need that you claim your spouse is not meeting. Make sense? Very careful with that. Um, I'm going to, we talked about individuality. Uh, adoration and treasure, I think, will slip that. Dealing with flirtatious people while married. You want to talk about that? You talked about it? Okay. Number four, quickly, quality time. Um, I talked about scheduling family time, uh, communicating to do it. Um, you need to have caring in your family. Just common courtesy, opening the door and, and those kind of things. Just common courtesy, seeking... All, you know, I'm not perfect at this, but I often am trying to think, how can I bless my wife today? How can I, how can I relieve some kind of burden for her? I'm not always perfect at it, but I'm striving for that. Just showing that caring. Whatever your spouse... How many of you have read the book Five Love Languages? How many of you have not read that book? If you have not read that book, I encourage you to get on Amazon before Sabbath and order it so it'll be on your step when you get home. And uh, read that book, and that will... Every person has a way that they feel loved when someone does a certain thing for them. And that book teaches you how to love each other and to identify your own love language and then to meet it. Keeping that courtship going and keeping that commitment. Um, so in that quality time, we talked about this, no cell phones, social media, having family talks, family worships, uh, just being together. You know, I encourage 30 minutes per day with your spouse at least. When I say 30 minutes, I don't mean like... Quality time. I'm talking quality time where we're doing nothing but having a focus on each other. If you can do an hour, that's even better. One night per week on a date night. One day each month and one weekend per quarter that you are spending in family time or at least uh, together with yourself. And then one week per year. It's not that hard to do that. If you schedule it, amen? If your family is your number one ministry then that's the most important thing. All right, the last area is intimacy, emotional and physical. So three areas of intimacy, spiritual, intellectual, and physical. Yes? Without the first two, gentlemen, it's not likely that the third is going to happen or happen very well, just to be straight up with you. And so you must connect with your spouse spiritually, having some kind of worship together, intellectually and emotionally, um, being vulnerable towards each other and doing those things that we talked about just a minute ago. And then the physical will often lead to the physical. Um, ladies, men uh, need physical typically more than most ladies. It's just a need that they have. Gentlemen, ladies need that emotional and that that emotional connection. They need that heart-to-heart -heart time. They need that quality time. My wife's greatest, uh, 
her love language is quality time. She likes me to spend, and I noticed that my son has the same, it's very unusual for a male to have quality time as their love language, but my son has that quality time. He wants me to spend time with him. And so um, those things have to be met before that physical is really going to be a possibility. Just in closing here, your spouse is your greatest what? Friend, other than Jesus. And treat them that way. Amen? Remember how you treated them before you dated. Let each give love rather than exacting it. Cultivate that which is noblest in yourselves and be quick to recognize the good in each other. And uh, I'll just move on from that. But give each other grace. If you can remember anything from this talk, it is to give each other what? Grace. Remember that your spouse needs a Savior just like you. Amen? In other words, your spouse is not perfect. Neither are you. And if you both can realize that and give each other grace and give each other love, even if you feel like you're not receiving love, if you're having that covenant relationship, then you're, if you're striving to make each other happy without worrying about your own happiness, then God will make happiness come, will He not? I'm telling you, He will. And I want to leave you with this promise. I do want to read this. Matthew 18 and verse 19, Jesus says this, Again I say to you that if two of you agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. That's a powerful text. Because if we can agree in our homes to be loving, to be kind, if we can agree to stay together no matter what happens, if we can agree that by the grace of God we're going to have a happy home, God's promises that if we can agree to it, it will be what? It will be done. And He will do it for you. Amen? How many of you believe that to be true today? Yes? How many of you want to have that type of relationship? Yes? You believe God's promise is true? Amen? And how many of you want to have that covenant relationship? How many of you are willing to give up yourself to have it? How many of you are willing to seek the happiness of your spouse above yourselves to have it? Amen? And how many believe that what you, ha what you can have with your spouse, with God's help, will be greater than what you're going to find somewhere else? Amen? The grass is greener on the other side. You know why? Because they water and fertilize it. Nobody gets my jokes here. I don't understand. <laughs> the grass is greener on the other side because they water and fertilize it. Amen? And if we water and fertilize the grass on our side, it's also going to be what? Amen? Amen. Amen. So get out your spiritual, your emotional, your, your, your intimate fertilizer, grass, seed, and water, and start watering your marriages, and they'll just continue to grow. If they're already good, they'll get better. If they're already better, they'll become the best. Amen? And we always have something to grow in, and the Lord is going to keep leading us. Any thought you want to have? All right. We're going to take a moment now to have some reflection time, and we'll just take a minute here. And I just want you to maybe close your eyes, bow your heads, and just speak to the Lord now, and let Him speak to you, and ask Him what it is He wants you to surrender in your life and your spouse. Precious Father, we thank you so much for the great privilege we've had to share together. We went a little bit over today, but Lord, we just pray that it'll be still a blessing and that we can take some things home with us today. Lord, help us to love and understand each other. Help us to have patience, Lord. Dwell within our hearts and may we seek to bless the other. May we choose to be happy. May we choose to love even, Lord, when we don't feel like it, even when we struggle. But, Lord, when we are willing to choose, our hearts become open to you, and you can fill us with your love. You can fill us with your joy, and that love for, from you will overflow to each other, and we can have happy homes. Lord, naturally, carnally, we are selfish people. We are selfish individuals. 
But we want, Lord, to be more like Christ. We want to be just like Christ. We want to love as He loved. And, and Lord, we want to live as He lived. And so by the grace of God, make us all that you want us to be. And Lord, help us to choose this day love. Help us to choose this day self-sacrifice and be focused upon our spouse as you would have us to be. Lord, may you give us, by your grace, that covenant relationship. This is our prayer today, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.